after Mancia's job all day long is just sit there at that fence and make sure that that glue is strong. Hello everyone, I'm Morgan, co-founder of Primal Kitchen and host of the Primal Kitchen podcast. In this episode, we're chatting with CEO and co-founder of premium medical probiotic company, Pendulum, Colleen Cutliff. Colleen has a PhD in biochemistry and microbiology from John Hopkins University and more than 15 years of experience leading and managing biology teams in pharmaceuticals and biotech. She and her team's mission at Pendulum is to improve the lives of millions through microbiome products, specifically medical grade probiotics. Before we get started, a brief reminder that any and all opinions and views shared by hosts and guests on this podcast are the speaker's own. Do not represent the view of Primal Kitchen or its affiliates or parent company. Hello, Colleen. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to meet you. We um, met through a friend, Casey, who's one of the founders of Level. So this is like a very, um, it's a great introduction. I had asked her on the podcast what her favorite supplements were, and she was like, you have to talk to Colleen. I'm obsessed with it. Is it called, how do you pronounce it? Acromancia? Is that right? Yes, Acromancia. Nice. And Pendulum and the whole thing. So I'm super excited today to talk to you about probiotics, but I want to get a little bit in the background. So you obviously have a very science background. So how did you found Pendulum? How did you get here? Sure. Yeah. Uh, my background is basic science research. So um, I have the PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology. I did a pretty traditional postdoc after that at Northwestern. Um, and then I moved out to the Bay Area, uh, San Francisco Bay Area, and I was working in a pharmaceutical company. We were developing drugs for Parkinson's disease. Um, and then after that, I went to a, um, a startup company, which is kind of what everybody does when you live in Silicon Valley. Um, and that company went through rapid growth and went um, public. And I, on the other side of that IPO, I started this company with two co-founders. So um, I think what sort of happened for me, the evolution was really understanding how I wanted to make my mark in health and then really getting introduced into the startup world and how one can kind of actually start new ideas. Uh, and so started this company a little over 10 years ago. And the whole premise was the microbiome was really this new science, even though probiotics and yogurts have been around for decades, it's they're all premised on kind of the same handful of ingredients. And how could we use microbiome science to really target a lot more than just, you know, upset tummy um, when it comes to our health. And that was kind of the whole idea behind the company. We could tap into the microbiome and uh, that's what we've been doing for the last decade. I love it. And so where did the research lead you? What is Acromancia? Like, give me the lowdown. What, 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 like, did you guys research first, discover some things and then implement them in products? Or were you set out to like solve a certain particular health problem? Or did you just feel like like le we could do more than lactobacillus, right? I mean, where where where'd it come from? Yeah, well, I kind of had a personal um, uh, part of the microbiome that I was interested in, and it really started with my daughter who was born almost two months premature. Um, she was four and a half pounds when she was born. Uh, she spent the first month of her life in intensive care, and she received multiple doses of antibiotics. And that's just kind of um, what they do for preemies prophylactically because they're so fragile. And this study came out about 10 years ago when we were thinking about the microbiome that showed that infants who were on a lot of antibiotics were more prone to chronic diseases later on in life, like obesity and type 2 diabetes. And then the study, that study was repeated by the Mayo Clinic, and they showed that these kids are, if you are under two years old and you're on a lot of antibiotics, you're not only more prone to obesity and type 2 diabetes, you're also more prone to things like allergies, asthma, celiac disease, ADHD. And so all of it is because your microbiome is so important to your health and that these kids who are losing it really early through these antibiotics are somehow not able to actually recapture it and get the microbes that help them with things like metabolism and their immune responses. And so for me, it felt like a kind of a personal agenda to go figure out how can we establish, you know, what's missing in the microbiome that is specifically around metabolism and how do we help people metabolize foods better? And so we started out really going after people that have kind of the ultimate, um, you know, in metabolism disorder, so metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, and kind of working back from there to really tackle how does your gut, which metabolizes all the food that you eat, really help you improve the metabolism of those foods and improve your own metabolism? So that's what your products do. That's what they're targeted for. Metabolic disease? Yes. So the first product we have is our flagship product, Pendulum Glucose Control. That's actually for people with type 2 diabetes. It helps people lower their A1C and their blood glucose spikes. 
Well, then we also have metabolic daily, which is for anybody who's trying to metabolize their sugars and carbs better. And then we have Ackermansia, which is a single strain. It's one of the strains that's in metabolic daily, and it's also in glucose control. Um, and this strain is sort of emerging as a keystone gut strain. It's the only strain that we know of right now that literally lives in your gut lining. So if you think about your gut lining like a fence, I actually have a wooden fence in my backyard. There are all these wooden planks and they, um, they're held together by glue. And when we first lived in this house, the fence was shiny and new and fantastic. But what happens over time and through seasons is that that glue can start to get loose. Those planks can start to get weakened and even fall. And your gut lining is literally exactly the same way. You have these planks. They're held together by glue. And your microbiome, your gut lining is, is really important for keeping your microbiome in place. And those planks, if they start to fall and that glue starts to get weak, that's where you get so-called leaky gut. The, all these things that are inside your microbiome can now get outside of it into your bloodstream. You have heightened inflammation, terrible immune responses, all these kind of outcomes of not having a strong gut. And Ackermansia's job all day long is just sit there at that fence and make sure that that glue is strong. That's what it does for a living. We don't know any other strain that does that. And so it turns out that you could start to lose Ackermansia over time, and then it presents itself in all these crazy ways. And um, that's kind of what makes Ackermansia. And more and more research is coming out every day about this. There's over 2,000 publications on it, but it is becoming like the keystone strain to have you for gut health. Interesting. And so I'm assuming that it's super helpful for people with leaky gut, but like if you don't have leaky gut yet, is it more like preventative or can you, can it treat after you already have like dysbiosis? Well, actually for a lot of people, you start to lose the strain. And of course, none of us know when we're losing a strain in our microbiome. This naturally. Yeah. It's when it starts to present itself through things like leaky gut. And it can also show up for like, you know, worse inflammation, more bloating, your metabolism slows down. All these things are related to your gut microbiome. And so you start to have those symptoms. And then uh, there are these tests where you can see that you're low in acromancia or you might suspect, oh my gosh, it's my gut health. And so you can supplement with acromancia and you can start to rebuild the acromancia, which then can rebuild your gut lining and get you back to where you used to be. So does everybody need acromancia? Would you say like, is it beneficial for everyone? Well, first of all, it's one of the most um, prevalent microbes in your microbiome. So like one to 3% of a healthy microbiome has acromancia. When you think about like the tens and thousands of strains, the fact that this one is like 3% of your microbiome, it tells you what an important thing it is. And over time, you can start to lose acromancia if you're not having enough fiber or polyphenols in your diet. You, we start to lose acromancia as we age. You could lose acromancia as you go through periods of high stress. I don't know if you've been through any periods of stress, but that is one of the reasons. I have three kids under five. I like live in a daily period of high stress. You're, you're living in high stress. Yeah. Um, we can we lose it as we go. Our circadian rhythm changes. So whenever you travel and like day becomes night, night becomes day, you lose acromancia. And then for women, every time we go through a menstrual cycle and then we go through menopause, we actually also lose acromancia. So... To answer your question, if you're experiencing any of those things, you're probably depleted in acromancy and could use boost. Have you seen people who have leaky gut start taking acromancy on like symptoms improve? A hundred percent. That's one of the biggest responses we get is people talking about all these symptoms of leaky gut. So diarrhea, constipation, bloating, pain. These are all things that they start to um, feel better on when they've healed their gut through acromancia. So cool. Okay. I feel like I have that one down. Now take me back. You mentioned the first one, which was like called glucose control. Is that right? Yes. And you said that's only for type two diabetics. Pendulum glucose control was designed for people with diabetes. Um, and, but I will tell you this. So I don't have pre-diabetes or diabetes, but that's the product that I take because I wore a continuous glucose monitor. And even though I don't have those diseases, I am aging. And as we age, as I said, you start to lose these strains. You don't need a doctor or any device to tell you this. Our metabolism slows down. And what I found when I wore a glucose monitor, I kind of nerded out on this and did like a placebo control on myself. I saw compared to placebo that when I was on the formulation glucose control, that all my glucose spikes and crashes were minimized. And for me, I knew when I was on the product because actually my workouts were a lot stronger. So when you're able to metabolize sugars better, it shows up for people in different ways. So like if you're ever feeling like, oh, I get that post-lunch slump or I just feel more sluggish or I get brain fog, all of these things are associated with not being able to metabolize glucose well. Crazy. I have worn the levels monitor on and off for years. I've also been pregnant and breastfeeding, full disclosure. I'm still breastfeeding my youngest. So I've been pregnant or breastfeeding for like five years straight. 
as you know, pregnancy like can mess with your blood sugar. I think like it's very common. For, I mean, I know not everyone has like, what is it called when you have gestational diabetes? But I, I do know, I've talked to Kelly Levesque a lot about this. Like if you're not yeah. even glucose or if you're, yeah, if you're not even sensitive free pregnancy, sometimes some of these issues can come up without being, you know, without having gestational diabetes. I feel like I'm pretty locked in with my diet and I find the same thing. I'm not like very regulated. Like I definitely need to, so I need to be taking the glucose control. Yeah, I'm going to ship you some so that you can try it. Okay. But now tell me the difference between the glucose control one and the daily one. The biggest difference is just dose. So pendulum glucose control is the highest dose of all the five strains that are in there. These strains all work together. These, This is actually published clinical data. These strains work together to help you metabolize sugars and carbs for if you are you know trying to improve that. Metabolic daily is the exact same formulation is all the same strains in there, but it's just at a lower dose. And so rather than being kind of at this full clinical dose, it's at a lower dose. And what that allowed us to do was to really drop the price. So for, so glucose control is $165 a month and then metabolic daily is $49 a month. And it's because it's this lower dose. And it also allows people who are like, well, I don't have diabetes. I don't know if I need that full dose to really kind of step into this with a product that they can take every day and feel good about helping them to metabolize um, their sugars and carbs better. So cool. And tell me about the clinical research you guys did on it. And I also want to know what strains are in it. I'm so curious. So the clinical studies we did, and the, the, the key one is published in BMJ, which is um, uh, kind of one of the, the best clinical journals out there, which is really exciting for us to see it in there. But that one was really a double-blinded, randomized, placebo-controlled trial where we took people with type 2 diabetes, and we basically either gave them placebo, or we gave them pendulum glucose control, or we gave them actually a subset, so just three of the five streams. Um, in order to see what impact it had. And what it showed was that compared to placebo, people who were on glucose control saw their A1C drop by 0.6 and saw their blood glucose spikes drop by 34%. And that is basically on par with the diabetes drug. That's crazy. Is that like similar like metformin? Yeah. I mean, we, and we asked people, don't make any dietary changes. Don't change anything else about your lifestyle because we just want to know what the probiotic is doing. But effectively what it does is it helps you metabolize your foods. And a lot of people don't know this, but there's a huge GLP-1 craze happening right now with those and that. Um, and a lot of people don't know this, which is that actually GLP-1 comes from your gut microbiome. And so what these strains do is they stimulate your body to make GLP-1, but in a natural way, as opposed to the drugs. And that's how it's actually helping you with your A1C and blood glucose spikes. And so is our people's weight moving like when they're on the product? I mean, I'm sure you, can you make weight loss claims? I'm not, I know there's like a lot of regulations in the supplement space about what you can and cannot say, but are people like experiencing those benefits from I'll give my caveat, which is that we have not done a clinical trial to look at weight. And so we don't have claims around weight, but we definitely have um, a lot of customer testimonials uh, reporting improvements. And so I think it's, you know, the, the, the two are really tied together, metabolism. For sure. Um, fascinating. And when did you guys launch this company? Well, we started the company like 10 years ago. We spent the first eight years of it really doing all of this R&D research and the preclinical and the clinical trials leading up to launching the product. And we kind of had this um, belief that the microbiome could help people with disease and with metabolism. And the mission of the company was to really help people. So if we didn't have positive results coming out of those trials, we weren't going to launch a product. So we only had products at market for about two or three years, but we've been around for over a decade. So cool. I just like love what's happening in the supplement space now in the sense that there's, I don't know, there's a lot of businesses out there that are like doing the research first in a good way. And you're not just like dumping your money in some filler, you know, I don't know. I feel like there's a lot of snake oil in the space prior, but now you can really find some companies that are really like doing it right. So it's great. It's great to see that. And I know a big thing in the probiotic space that's kind of been like questioned is just like delivery format and like, I don't know, is the word bioavailability. I just feel like there's, are the probiotics even alive when you're getting them? Like, are you guys doing anything interesting in just like encapsulation or delivery format or are they soil based or like, how are you guys managing that just to make sure the probiotics are actually effective? I mean, it sounds like that clearly has been proven, but I'm just curious if there's any technology there. 
Yeah. Well, I think it's super important to think about delivery. And um, so we have enteric coated capsules that allows these to get through the stomach acid and they're time released capsules. So that means that they don't, you know, open up until they get to the distal colon, which is where the gut microbiome is, where all these strains are supposed to reside. And so um, that's really important. But then I would say probably the way we know that they're being delivered is because of these clinical outcomes, but then also because we actually measure people's microbiomes. And you can see that after they're on product that they see you see the appearance of these strains. So you know that the strains are getting delivered there um, and the technology is really in the capsule itself. And, and I would say the other part of the technology is really around the manufacturing of the strains. So we're kind of one of the only probiotics companies in the world that grows our own strains. And it's because these are proprietary strains. You actually can't find them anywhere else on the market. Um, and so we, we didn't grow them, we didn't decide early on we wanted to grow our own strains. We grew them because nobody else could grow them for us. And so in the manufacturing, there's a lot of stuff we do to make sure that the viability and the activity of the strains um, is the same in every pill, in every bottle um, that we sell to people. Crazy. And so where are you growing the strains? How, what do they What do they grow on? Don't they need like something to eat or how does it work? Yeah. So a uh, great question. So the first thing to know is that your gut microbiome um, is in this area called the distal colon and the distal colon has no oxygen in it. So unlike our environment, which has a lot of oxygen, we need oxygen to survive. The gut microbiome has no oxygen in it. And so the strains that live there, they actually can't tolerate any oxygen. They're what's called strict anaerobes. And this was the challenge to manufacturing. So all the strains that are out there on the market today, lactobacillus, if you look at your label, you know, lactobacillus bifidobacterium, these don't actually reside there. So you can grow them and there can be some oxygen in the system. It's not a big deal. But these strains, the ones that are in our formulation, so acarmancia, these clostridial strains, they cannot have any oxygen. So the first thing you have to know is you have to create a manufacturing plant that end to end keeps all the oxygen out of the system. The second thing is that the way you grow these strains is a lot like the way if you've ever been to a brewery or a vineyard or they have these big kind of vats where they're growing, um, uh, they're, they're making their wine or they're growing their beer. It's literally the same. We use a lot of the same equipment when we're growing our strains. So you basically are growing your strains in this media and it has all the nutrients that they need and the sugars that they need in order to grow. And then you, um, if you've ever been to a vineyard, they have to like separate the wine from the, the grape kind of skins and seeds and things like that. So they do this kind of centrifugation process where they spin them down and the liquid goes on top and all the like um, skin and seeds go to the bottom. We do the same thing. We spin these and all the liquid stays at the top and the cells, in this case, we actually want the stuff that's at the bottom. We take those, we freeze dry them, and then we put them into pills. And once they're freeze dried, so they're like in a powder format, they're really stable. So now you can put them in a pill. You could have them, you know, these pills on your counter. They're really not sensitive to oxygen anymore. But all the manufacturing leading up to that required us to build this plant that kept all the oxygen out until we got it into a powder form. This is crazy. This is like... It was crazy. That's Some people are like, why did you have to raise so much money to make a probiotic? And it's because we had to do all this initial discovery to figure out what strains and we had to pay for clinical trials. But moreover, we had to like build a manufacturing plant. Yeah. Nuts. Have you guys raised a ton of money? How's it going over there on the entrepreneurial front? It's good. I mean, I think that there is a... Um, you know, a lot of interest in the microbiome space, but in particular for companies that are trying to build novel things that have efficacy behind them. So we've raised a little um, under 150 million into the company. Wow. It takes a lot of money to make these products. <laughs> yeah, no, it's very cool. I just asked because it seems like it's like, it's just such a tough world out there right now. I have a lot of friends in the space who have founded food companies or supplement companies, and they're just like, it's hard to raise money right now. It's like really hard. So I was curious if you got your deal done before like it kind of became extra hard or if you had to deal with any of that. Well, I, I think it's really hard to raise money if you're just starting a company now or you just have your beginnings kind of proof points. But I and and I think it's also really hard if you have to kind of explain why your product is going to get uptake for us in a lot of ways because the product is so differentiated and has these clinical trials. And we have a ton of IP around not only the composition of matter, but also around the process of manufacturing. We just have a big moat around these these products and they have uh, you know, efficacy that 
really there's no other product on the market, no other probiotic that can show these kind of, you know, A1C and blood glucose spike lowering. And then we have, you know, incredibly loyal customers. And so we have, you know, a differentiated product with IP protection around it that's in the consumer space that has, um, you know, some really good revenue growth behind it. And so I think that's what allow- is what's allowed us to fundraise in these hard times. Um, plus, we have just like amazing investors that um, like have deep pockets. And so, frankly, you know, they've been super supportive. So, like, we're backed by Sequoia, True Ventures, Coast Ventures, Meritech. So, it's been, and actually, the first investors were Mayo Clinic. They've actually come in on every. And so, it's been a really solid um, support network that we've been lucky to have. I love it. Well, good for you guys. Congrats. That's exciting and just like really hard to navigate while you're also trying to run a company. So yes. And you guys that have then been had a product in market like two years. Yeah. And we we started out with pendulum glucose control. That was the only product that we had initially when we launched was our flagship. And since then we've launched um, several different products. And so like metabolic daily that I was just telling you about, we just launched that in January. So we're, we're relatively new to the market. I love it. And are people seeing like in the, did you do clinical trials on both of those, like the glucose control and the daily one? We lo- we did tr- trials on glucose control and then we have ongoing trials on metabolic daily. It's slightly different. I was just curious, like are people seeing, because the price point on the other one might be like out of the range for folks listening, but maybe they want to try the l- lower entry price point than isn't as potent. I was curious if you had like, you know, we're seeing similar, but maybe not as intensified results on that one. You don't know. That's exactly right. And and actually, because Metabolic Daily is for people, you know, it's not necessarily for people with type 2 diabetes, you wouldn't expect to see these kind of, you know, A1C drops. I don't think regular people are measuring their A1C and, and trying to, you know, lower it. And so what we get, though, is data back showing that people are experiencing the improvements of digestion, metabolism, reduced inflammation, reduced you know food cravings, all of that stuff that's associated with metabolizing your sugars and carbs better. And to be totally honest, I mean, you know that if you you know eat a bunch of sugar and then you have a sugar crash later, like you, you most people can kind of feel that that's happening, the sugar, and the sugar crash, and so people can experience that they're having a much more stable reaction to sugar. Interesting. I can't wait to try it. I'm so excited. I'm going to post my like. Been pretty locked in on the levels. I want to see what happens before and after. So for you personally, I'm just curious, you're like doing the entrepreneur thing. It sounds like you probably have a lot going on, um, but obviously very committed to health and wellness. Like what are your favorite health and wellness tips or like what does your kind of like routine in life look like in the health and wellness genre? Well, I think when we think about health and wellness, there's sort of a few important pillars, right? There's nutrition, there's exercise, of course, you know, say there's microbiome, um, and there's mental health. And so I think, you know, all four of those are are really important factors. I am terrible at nutrition. I mean, I really want to be good at, you know, eat well and all that, but I am have a lot of weaknesses. And so I would say that's not great for me, but I do think that for me, I, the mental health part is really important. So um, I exercise every day. I make sure at least I get something in because that's super helpful for me. So for me, exercise and mental health are really tied in. And then the other part is a lot of compartmentalization. So, I mean, I have this business, but I also have a family. I have kids, I have a husband, I have dogs. All of There's all these needs that are happening outside of work. And so for me, it's really important to have time that's allocated to each of these things that are super important to me. And every day is a thousand different decisions on where you're going to spend your time and your energies. And so being really thoughtful about how you want to spend your time and what you're prioritizing and how you're going to break it all up is I think really important. And so for me, every day, that ritual of making the choices that are aligned with what I said were important to me. And this time is allocated to this and I'm not going to stray from that and being really disciplined about it. I think that's a really important part to health and wellness for me. Love it. Do you have, or what other supplements do you take? I know you take your own, but what other supplements are you taking? I don't take anything else. Actually, to tell you the truth, I was not a believer in any, I'm, and maybe I would start, I still am, not really a believer in, you know, all these supplements and, you know, not really seeing the strong clinical data behind them. I've kind of gone on and off a few different things, um, but the one that I consistently feel a difference with are, are the ones that that we've made. Yeah. Well, it's kind of like when you see the clinical data yourself, you're like, it's hard not to be so con- so convinced. Um Okay, what is like a health hack you're doing that most people might not be doing? Is there anything like 
what kind of exercise do you do? I see you might have like something in the background there. Is that a walking treadmill desk? Yes. No, it's not. I wish I had one of those. That's their regular. Okay. Is that like a Peloton or something? What is that? It is. It is. It's a, it's a Peloton treadmill. Is it the treadmill Peloton? It's the treadmill Peloton. I actually, um, I hate running. And so, um, I, so I know I must be burning the most calories when I'm doing it. And so, um, I, I have the, the tread. Actually, I mean, I, I love having it in here because this is my, I, I work from the office most days, but one day a week I work from home and it's like just sitting there looming over me, like, get on me. Yep. And you got to do this. Yeah. I love it. So running, that's the form of exercise. Well, I kind of do some running and then uh, a bunch of other stuff, but I, but running is, I would say like for me, that's, it's really hard. I don't enjoy running at all. And so um, I do think I burn those calories. But the, the, the health hack that I would say um, has kind of come to the top of my list that um, I've been sharing out with people is a lot of people kind of are doing intermittent fasting. And even if you're not deliberately doing intermittent fasting, you're not eating while you're asleep. Um, but what I think we don't think about as much is when you're breaking that fast or when you're having breakfast, um, that first thing that you put into your body is the most important thing. Because your microbiome has all these bugs and they eat whatever you're eating, that's what they're eating. For those of us who have been pregnant, we're familiar with that concept. But you have all these microbes that are constantly in you. They're eating what you're eating. And when you're fasting, when you're not eating, you're basically starving all of them and you're putting them all onto equal ground with each other. And so the first food that you feed basically dictates who becomes the winner and who replicates and who's kind of left behind. And so the first thing you put into your body and you're breaking that fast is your decision every day on which bugs you're going to feed and which ones you're not. Okay, so explain that to me though then. So what should I be putting in first? Like what's good and what's not good? Yes, high fiber, high polyphenol. Just think about fi- high fiber, high polyphenol foods. So fruits and fruits and vegetables, um, pomegranates are really high in polyphenol. Actually, dark chocolate has a lot of polyphenols in it. Not that I'm ready. Really- I eat dark chocolate in the morning. You just made me feel so much better about my life. Sometimes I have matcha and then I'm like, I'm going to have a piece of dark chocolate and then I just don't eat again until lunch. So anyway, I feel so validated right now. You're feeding your acromancia with that dark chocolate. Um, and so all of those are, are really important. Uh, I think the first thing to put in after you're fasting. Okay. And polyphenols like green tea has polyphenols in it, doesn't it? Yep. Green tea has polyphenols. Actually, red wine also has polyphenols. I'm not suggesting people start their day with red wine. But um, yeah, green tea, pomegranates, dark chocolate, and red wine are some of the... And then there's... Um, um, you know, in addition to pomegranates, you know, blueberries, all of these different kinds of berries tend to be pretty, pretty high in polyphenols. So fascinating. So can I tell you what I break my fast with every day? And then you can like tell me what you think about this. Okay. So I have a, a matcha latte. So I do matcha powder, which is high in polyphenols, green tea. Then I have, I, I add primal kitchen collagen fuel to it. So it's pretty much coconut milk powder mixed with collagen. So some proteins and fat. And then I do put a scoop of acacia fiber. This all goes in my matcha. So it's like matcha, protein, collagen, protein powder, a scoop of acacia fiber. And then I've been adding Symbiotica's magnesium supplement. They have like a liquid magnesium that's vanilla cream. And I've just been putting it in my matcha because it tastes good. And I'm like done with my magnesium for the day. What are your thoughts? It's, it's great. So you're getting your polyphenols from your matcha. You're getting your fiber. Um, and so those are the two biggest things to be throwing in there for your microbiome. So you're, I don't even know if you're depleted in any, in any of these gut microbes because you're- Oh, I'm sure I am. I've, I, call, I, like a, I come from a long line of women with like health, gut issues. Like the constipation in my family is like generational, I feel like. You should definitely, okay, I'm not, I definitely want you to try product to see if that helps because it could just be kind of a natural depletion it's a that's causing this problem. Yeah, no, I mean, I was just talking to my sis- my cousin about it, like on the tennis court earlier this week. She's type one diabetic and she was, she's like, I'm Morgan, I am like still like we were when we were 18, like struggling with constipation. I've like, I think I'm pretty much past most of it, but she was like still dealing with that. I'm going to have to send her this episode and tell her to get on the bandwagon, but Okay. That's like fasting. I've never heard that before. I mean, we all hear like, it's so important to break your fast, but everyone's always emphasizing, I feel like protein, like start your day with proteins or you're not hungry, yada, yada. But if it's something as simple as like adding fiber, what do you think about acacia fiber as a fiber? 
I think it's it's fine. The I, I think inulin is one of the most effective fibers, especially if you can get an inulin that has all the different chain lengths in it, um, because that feeds a ton of these your butyrate producing bugs. And so these strains that help your body produce butyrate, that's one of the most important small molecules that your gut microbiome makes. They're fed by inulin. And so that's also a really good fiber to add. Inulin from chicory root, oftentimes. Yeah, we used to have that in our bars. I'm in a... Um, it kind of has a sweet uh, taste to it. So um, you can add it to your coffee or your tea and it kind of, I think it makes it taste nicer. Yeah, so inulin instead of acacia fiber. That's what I... Is there a certain brand you like that has all of those things you just mentioned? Um, I don't have a particular brand that I like, but I think that you can... And now I'm realizing that when you ask me if I take supplements, I mean, I do add inulin and stuff. So That's my answer to that. And this isn't like a quiz. You you can't fail here. You're doing great. But yeah, I mean, I think really any inulin that is coming from a, um, you know, good brand and they, there's good quality control behind it. Good. Okay, cool. I'm going to make that switch. That's like great, great feedback. What other like gut hacks do you have for us? Like anything else we should be thinking about? Um, I think diversity is sort of the name of the game. So um, essentially you start out with a, well, when you're an infant, you have like very few microbes, but then as you kind of become a teenager, which many of us sort of think is like the optimal time of health in our life, you have an incredibly diverse microbiome. So you have a lot of different kinds of strains doing different functions. And what happens over time and as people get sick is they start to be depleted in that diversity. So you lose certain strains and functions. And so the thing that you can do to increase the diversity of your strains is to increase the diversity of the foods that you're eating. So, you know, try that Singaporean food, go out and, you know, challenge your body with these different foods. And I think a lot of people as we age, we start to actually cut back on the foods we're eating because of GI distress. And the way most of us deal with gut distress is we're like, okay, well, now I know what I can't eat. I don't eat this. I don't eat that. I don't, these are things I can't eat. And that's actually really not great for your gut microbiome because now you're just feeding certain strains and you really need that diversity. And so giving your gut things like acromancy and metabolic daily allows you to metabolize these foods. And then you can start opening up to different kinds of foods. But obviously we know like, you know, things, fruits and vegetables are really good for you. So if you can diversify fruits and vegetables, that's really great. Um, but then really just trying to get as many different kinds of foods into your system helps you flourish in the diversity of your microbiome. Yeah. I used to want to start like a diet movement that was like five plants a day. Like, you know, you can eat whatever you want. You just have to have like five different vegetables a day because I feel like we focus so much, to your point, on like what we can't eat and you end up like obsessing about food. I just like don't think it's a healthy mind state. It's true. And and you're you're obsessing over it and you're thinking about like, well, when should I be eating it and how much can I eat? And um, and it just ends up being, you know, not having a really great relationship with food. No. Yeah, I totally agree. I love it. Well, this has been so invite insightful. So I have one last question that I ask everyone. Um, but what is something about you that most people don't know? Well, I was gonna share um kind of something that I do before I go into some of these like really big meetings where I know like you have to be on like basically the equivalent of game day. So when you go into these investor pitches, you basically get one hour to present your idea, answer all their really hard questions, and you better be on fire when you're an hour. And so one of the things that I learned to do before going into these kind of really big, important meetings is um, there's two things. So one is um, somebody else actually taught this to me. Um, is to go into the bathroom or if you have your own space, but to go into a bathroom, you know, cl close the door and basically spread out as big as you can get. You, I spread my arms out, I spread my legs out. I basically try to be physically as large as you can be. And there's something about that physical motion of getting as big as you can, like think about a bear, um, that translates into your inside. And so when you walk into that meeting, you actually feel bigger. And, and I think it's really important when you're in these meetings to have a presence. And so that helps you kind of get that that presence. And somebody else taught that to me and I was like, that's so goofy. And then I tried it and I was like, oh my gosh, I really did feel like, you know, a bigger person, a more confident person, a stronger person just by doing that little physical routine right before going to these meetings, literally, you know, minutes beforehand. I've done something similar to that. Like sometimes when I'm nervous, I'm like, I need to like move my body. Like I can't sit still, but there is a scene in Ted Lasso for anybody watching and I can't remember what her name is, but the woman who owns the soccer team, football team, she does that. She like does a big bear growly thing in front of the mirror and it's like a 
anyway, I think there's some legitimacy to that. But you said there was two things you do. Is there one other thing? Oh, the other goofy thing I do is before I walk into the meeting when I'm still in my car uh, is... Um, so like I, I grew up in the South. I listened to country music almost like exclusively. Um, and I put on heavy metal. So I, it's like 30 seconds. It's just this adrenaline pump. It's all part of this adrenaline. You're getting big. You're listening to this is not music I normally listen to. So my brain really responds to it. And then I go in and I'm fired up. It's basically like the equivalent of, you know, running out onto the field to your song. And so, I mean, although it's not my song, it's something that gets me kind of pumped up. But I think when you go into these big meetings, um, it's easy to kind of actually get in your own head and to get nervous and to think about like, okay, I'm going to like practice my lines or I'm going to be thinking about who else is in the room and, and and all of the stuff and to just kind of get into your own head. And I think making, doing deliberate things like get out of that um, kind of physically and audio wise are just two tricks I've learned. I love that. This is so great. Thank you. Um, okay. Tell everyone listening where they can find Pendulum and more information. If you have, I don't know if you have a following on your social or anything like that, give everybody the, di the digits. Yes, we would love for people to come to our, we have a ton of information on our website. I'd love for people to try Metabolic Daily or Acromancia just to see if it works for you. We're here to help people. So if it doesn't work, you know, it's we're uh, we actually have a money back guarantee. And so um, you can go to our website, which is pendulumlife.com. Uh, and if you use the code PRIMAL20, uh, you'll actually get 20% off of your first bottle of membership. Um, and we can all, you can also find our products um, on Amazon. So um, if you come to either pendulumlife.com or Amazon, you can buy our products. Awesome. Thank you so much, Colleen. This was great. I appreciate you sharing all your knowledge with us and I'm excited to try the product. I'm excited for you to try it too. Thanks so much for having me.